Hello and welcome into the Cubs on Deck podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss and today I am joined for a, a briefer episode. I'm joined with Brian Smith. Brian, how's it going, man? It's going good. You know, we're just like approaching the fun part of the offseason. We probably have one more week of like nothing happening on the free agency front and everyone getting frustrated and then we'll be off in full force. And, you know, it's like the most fun part of the year are the parts where your team's winning. I think the second most part is when you're just like hoping for, you know, monster free agents. A lot of optimism with Shohei's and the the Juan Sotos and the Pete Alonzos, and we're just going to yeah. get all of them. Is basically what's going to happen. I'm I'm <laughs> we're, we're we're landing every single big player on the market this this off season. No, it's funny. I I this past week. I mean, obviously the free agency opens at the ma- at the major league level, and and I guess just free agency opens in general, and and typically like nothing happens that first right. Definitely first week, really first month. A lot of times, you know, and so. It was interesting this past week. We got, I mean, it was it was not great news. It, it, was, it was bad news seeing the a lot of the the players moving on from the organization. What twenty? I think twenty five total guys that were mm. in the organization a couple weeks yep. ago are no longer. And it's like, I was like just reading through some of those names, and as I was reading through, like, I, I feel like some of the names that I saw that were released. I know that like like Michael McAveen was a name that yeah. really stuck out stuck out to me. Right, that we're moving on from Michael McAveen in the organization, and and it seems like yesterday that McAveen had just entered the organization. And some of those moves always like make me feel old in terms of like my coverage of, of Cubs prospects. You know what I mean? So that's always, yeah. that's always interesting. And with the like roster limit now coming down in the minor leagues, like those timelines are even shorter. And I think, you know, for, for those of us that follow this thing, like it's weird. The idea that you probably have like you probably have two calendar years to make a real impression with the organization and then you probably have a third year where it's like do or die. And that's like, a, you know, I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. The, the person that stands out the most to me is Scott Kobos, who got released. Yeah. Right. And when Kobos came into the organization, he was a, a, a non-drafted free agent in 2020. Right. In, 20, in the 2020 season, that short yeah. draft. And then he came out in 2021 and like killed it. Like he amazing was amazing. First he was impression. Amazing. I mean, yeah. I, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers, but like amazing. And now yeah. we're two seasons at, like you said, two seasons after that, and and he's no longer in the organization. So, yeah, it's just life comes at you fast a little bit, and it's it's rough. I, I'm wishing nothing nothing but the best for all those, whether it was a guy that was released or um, uh, elected minor league free agency, because we had several of those guys. Jonathan Perlaza is no longer in the organization now, oh. um, and he will he will have plenty of of love on the free agency market from other teams. So. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a new era for for a lot of for this organization's podcast in a lot of ways from those guys we've talked about for so long. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the week ahead I think is going to be one, and we're going to talk about it in this episode that's like filled with roster minutia stuff, which is mm-hmm. you know where people like us can get really nerdy and dig in, and you know I think for the people that are just like on Shohei Watch, it's going to be really frustrating. <laughs> but um, you know, I think I think these next couple of days are one where the minor leaguers sort of have like their ever so brief moment in the sun. And so I'm excited to sort of highlight them at this time. Yeah. So this, like I mentioned, this is going to be a quicker episode. Um, we were kind of going through the weeks here. Um, we're kind of going on, on this every other week or so uh, schedule. And this is not the normal day to, to release a show, obviously. Um, but we were kind of planning everything out and looking at, at uh, Tuesday the 14th is the deadline for adding players to the 40 man roster to protect them from being selected in the rule five draft. And so we wanted to come on and just do an episode kind of previewing that, that rule five draft list um, who we might see expect to be expect to be selected, who we expect the Cubs to protect in that draft. Um, And then we'll get back to their regularly scheduled programming in next week's episodes. We'll be back with an interview and and all that good stuff. But this is just a quick one. Probably going to go a half hour or so. Going to run through some of these names. Um, But I'm glad you pointed out before we started recording, Brian, that we probably need to give a run through a rundown of what the Rule 5 draft is. Because it's kind of it, it's strange, right? Like this is this is not something yeah. we see in other sports at all. There's a lot of things we don't see in other sports that happen in baseball, but like the Rule Five draft is especially strange. Um, and so uh, I'll I'll kind of give a rundown, and like I said, I'll I'll kick it to you if I'm forgetting anything because it's kind of a, a weird process. But basically, what the Rule Five draft is is it gives players an opportunity to be selected by other teams. So if a uh, player is in an organization for 
a while. It depends on when you're signed and all that good stuff. But but for several years in an organization, um, they get added to this Rule 5 draft uh, list. And so in order to be protected from potentially being drafted away from your team, the Cubs would have to add a guy to the 40-man roster, essentially making them ever like closer to, to being a big league player. Um, if they're not protected by being added to the 40-man roster, then they can be selected by any other team in the league in this draft. And the, the team play, play, pays a small fee in order to draft this player. That's not typically – that doesn't typically prevent a, a team from, from selecting somebody. Um, but that team can uh, – the, the, the Cardinals, the Brewers, the Mets, the, any other team in the league can select any player on that list um, from away from the Cubs. But the catch is – they have to stay on the major league roster. Essentially, they have to stay on the major league roster the entire season long. So um, in years past, the Cubs have seen guys like last year, Chris Clark was selected in the major league phase of the Rule 5 draft. He was selected by the Mariners. Uh, he would have had to stay on the Mariners roster at the major league level the entire year. He did not. Uh, they did not want to keep him on the major league roster. So he was offered back to the Cubs. And that's how he, he spent the entire year in AAA in the Cubs organization. Um, that's happened. Uh, Michael Rucker, that happened a few years ago. Um, the Orioles selected him away, did not keep him. And now he, then he went back to the Cubs organization. And now he is uh, on the Cubs 40 man roster. So um, it's just really, it's a way for players to not get stuck being held down in the minor leagues with one organization. If the Cubs have a crazy amount of depth, they can't add him to the 40 man roster. Well, he's good enough to play at the major league level. He goes to a different team. So I don't know. Did I describe that without getting, getting too crazy, Brian? Yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, it's it's about a half halfway into a player's tenure with an organization before they hit free agency that they become eligible for this. And yeah, I mean, I think you hit on the most important part, which is the idea of it is giving the players some leverage in the process to, you know, if someone else likes them a lot more than then they get plucked in here. And, you know, it's not super often that Rule 5 players become like, super meaningful MLB players with their new organization, but it does happen. I mean, Hector Rondon, who, you know, certainly close to our hearts in Chicago, like he originally went to Cleveland, the team where the Cubs got him from um, via the rule of five draft. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's probably a, a good like 10, 15 players that you would know that that came through that process. But yeah, I mean, most of the time we're talking about guys sort of, sort of very tail end of teams, 40 men rosters and wishes. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out this year that there's less of a crunch than there have been in the past few years. Um, yeah. In the past few years, it's felt like we're having this discussion, and it's like, man, the Cubs need to add five guys to the 40-man roster and protect them um, from the Rule 5 draft, and then the expectation that they're going to lose all these like three or four different guys. Now, that hasn't really happened. Uh, but it's felt like that more so in years past. This year, I think that the list is the list of possibilities is smaller. The list of guys that man, they're they're really borderline. They they really might get added is extra small. Um, and then the guy, the amount of guys that actually get added uh, might be the smallest we've seen in years. So that's really yeah. Let, let, let me jump in on about. that because you know I think that's really important. The what the Cubs always have to weigh when they approach this deadline is the value of getting a player away from the rule five draft versus the value of a 40 man roster spot that a couple like last year, for example, the Cubs knew like the, the Cubs were far enough away at the major league level that like they had a lot of open roster spots, but they also knew they had to add a ton of major league players. And so the value of those 40 man roster spots, it was like a really confusing time where like, it really was a crunch coming together at once this year. I think they have a little less to do at the major league level than they did in the past. Like they don't have to worry about getting to like nine free agents. Like they got mm -hmm. to a year ago, you know I mean? It's probably three to six or something. And so, you know, I think, I think like they're going to go into the process knowing about how many free agents they're thinking about how many spots they're going to have. And then, I, I think they can actually look at it in terms of, okay, who are the guys that might get taken and who are not? And it's not going to weigh so heavily like our 40 man roster is really preventing us from doing it. Yeah. One last bit of, of housekeeping um, with this is that right now the Cubs 40 man roster currently sits at 37 mm -hmm. players um, as it stands right now. Actually, what, I, I'll, I'll add one more bit of housekeeping here. Uh, a lot of times you will see 
that the guy selected in 40 man roster, I mean, I think you probably get this from the way we're describing this, but uh, guys selected in the rule five draft, a lot of times are the teams doing the selecting and, and getting players are the, the worst teams, the bad league. teams. Yeah. And the teams that are losing players are the, either the better teams or the deeper teams in the league. Yeah. Um, and so that's a general consistent. I didn't probably picked that up from the way we described it before, but worth pointing out again. Although my all time favorite Theo Epstein move is that after the Cubs won the world series, he made a selection in the rule five draft and it was Caleb Smith who actually became like a real good major league player. And the Cubs like, yeah. of course, didn't keep him on the roster the next season. They certainly didn't have the space to do it. I don't even really know why Theo thought it was even a possibility, but the fact that he like, you know, post World Series hangover had the intuition to draft a player that became a pretty solid big leaguer is like one of the like wilder, just like minutiae things that happened during his tenure. It had to be like just bragging at that point, right? Like, you know, exactly. like you can't keep him on the roster. It's like, hey, remember when I selected him in the Rule 5 draft? I knew how good he'd get, you know, okay. like. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, like I said, 37 guys on the on the 40 man roster right now. Um, in years past, we've seen like last year, the Cubs protected three guys, I believe is what it was, right? They get, they protected Brennan Davis, Kevin Alcantara and Ben Brown were the three guys they had last year. Um, so that kind of is in line here. Uh, if you want to see the full list of guys that are uh, rule five eligible to be drafted, you can, I know that there's two different places that have North side bound has that list um, on our website, but it's courtesy of um, Arizona Phil over at the cup reporter. So uh, there are quite a few names um, and we will not get into all of them because a lot of them won't be selected, obviously. So uh, I, I I'll guess also I'll... point out the Cubs probably like synthetically already added some guys in Luke Little and Daniel Palencia who were yes. going to be eligible for this. And that sort of motivated them getting called up sooner rather than later. So like, though, you know, in a way, the list that we're going to talk about today are the guys that weren't called up this year where like some guys actually already hit that process. You want me to kick it to you first to sure. what, what, what's the, what's the, the, is there one guy that stands out in particular as you see would likely get added to the Cubs 40 man roster on Tuesday? There's not like, and the crazy thing, like, I think for the first time in five, six years, like I don't see an obvious like 80% or better player to get added to it, which I think is really interesting. So like my big, my big takeaway from Tuesday is going to be, is it zero players or is it two players? Yeah. Both of those would surprise me. I think it's going to be just one, but you know, there's probably like two to four really interesting um, calls. I'm leaning towards just one. Um, just before we even get into players, if you had to bet on a number, are you going one as well? Yeah, I'm going one, but okay. I think I'm more likely to go zero than two. Like I, I think I, I am I'm, too. I would be more surprised if there were two that added than, than zero, but I, 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 I think one, I think one gets added. Um, I'll, I'll start all this off by saying like, I don't have a pick. Like I, I don't know who that one will be. I have, I have, so you mentioned that there's a, there's a few that are more, more likely than others. I've got five name, five names that I think are like kind of to me above the rest. Um, I do too. I, the, the, the five I've got are Pablo Aliendo. Michael Arias, Cole Franklin, Porter Hodge, and Bailey Horn. Same. Okay. Same right, list. Cool. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think there's there's several others that. Let's start with those five then, because th okay. there there's several others I think that that warrants mention, and we can mention those guys later. Uh, but let's start with those five. I guess with you going one as is is one your prediction then? Yes. What's your, what's your? Do you have a one? Yeah, I okay. I think the one the one that I think the Cubs will protect, I guess, yeah, is Michael Ar Arias um, from the South Bend Cubs. Is when he pitched at the end of the year, pitched at Myrtle Beach at the beginning of the year, had a really fantastic start to the season, uh, cooled a little bit in the second half with South Bend. Um, I think when I've read about his case on the internet just in the last couple weeks, like the people that say he won't be protected, the constant line you hear is like, hasn't pitched a double A yet, you know, unlikely to get drafted because of that, which I, I agree. And I don't agree because I think when teams uh, look at the rule five draft is they're not going to find a player that's in triple A and has awesome stuff and is ready to contribute in the majors. Those players get protected on their team's 40 men rosters and they're not available. 
So I think a team has to approach the Rule 5 draft looking at it in two ways. Do we want guys that we're pretty sure are like close to the majors and actually can work in the majors to some degree? Mm-hmm. Or do we want to go for guys that are toolsy that we think if we make one or two tweaks, like it might, there might be some growing pains, but they can actually make a difference. If a team is leaning that route, then Arius I think is like a great pick because um, the arm talent is absolutely incredible. Uh, and I think there's a couple like obvious tweaks that we can talk about that, that a team can make. So that would be my guess. I would say something like he's a 60 to 70% chance to get added. Yeah. I, and, and I think it's important to point out, like, like you mentioned Hector Rondon earlier, right? Yep. When the Cubs selected Hector Rondon, he had his first year, they did a heck of a dro- job trying to hide Hector Rondon in that bullpen. Um, he didn't pitch. It's it's he didn't pitch as much, and, and he had a rough year, right? Eventually, he became the Cubs closer in one of the best eras of Chicago Cubs, but the best era of Chicago Cubs baseball ever, right? Uh, Michael yeah. Arias, if he was selected in the Rule Five Draft, would he would he'd probably get hit hit around a little bit <laughs> at, at at the major league level. But who's to say in twenty twenty five or twenty twenty six? That he wouldn't be what Hector Rondon is. Um, I the fastball, he he has the fastball velo there. He has mm-hmm. that. I think the changeup is terrific. Yeah. Um, I think the slider is it can get there one day. Um, yeah, I, I think that Arius has a has a real case of being selected away. And I think that in the same way that the Cubs protected Manny Rodriguez a few years ago, where it kind of caught us off guard, I think yep. that like this is this is our attempt to be a little bit smarter because I think a lot of times with, with, I, I think a lot of us didn't really see the Manny Rodriguez edition coming. Uh, I, I, it was kind of like in the back of our minds, but we didn't really see that coming. I think this is us trying to be a little bit smarter with predicting how the Cubs will be. And I think Ma- Michael Arias might have the highest shot of being protected for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's two things to me that a other, another team can look at and they can say, we can do this better than the Cubs. And if they think that, then they're talking, you know, then they're going to see an amazing talent that's tweakable to be a major league reliever, at least if not more than that. First thing is the slider, the slider, like I would say three out of 10 sliders that he throws are like really pretty solid pitches. Um, I would say three out of 10 are pretty bad. And then the most of the time it's sort of like average, just sort of sub average pitch. Um, so a team, if they think that, you know, just a tiny sort of grip change tweak or something like that is going to unlock it. The other thing is his fastball is like metrically. I bet it's, I bet it grades amazing. Not only can he touch a hundred miles per hour with it, but he releases it from like a five ang- five eighths arm slot. And he's pretty short already. So it's a really low release. So that ball is going to look like it's exploding at the top of the zone. So I think a team can, can sort of, um, project that with you know the things they do behind the scenes they can get more swing and miss on that pitch whether it's helping him with command getting more pitches to the top third maybe getting behind the ball a little better getting a little better spin rate things like that uh if they see that i mean there there's probably not going to be 10 players available in this rule five that are anywhere close to the arm talent he is so you know if the cubs look at that and they say this is like the third best guy uh stuff plus wise that could be available, they might say, all right, we have to protect him. Even if it's just for a year, like we have to see what 2024 looks like with them. If you want to simplify things a little bit, it's, could you see um, insert relief pitcher here shoving for the Astros in a couple of years? Oh yeah, open? that's a good call. Then, yep. then, and the answer is yes. Uh, then you might want to add him to the 40 man roster. And that's what I see with Michael Arias, right? I think that, yeah. I can see him working in the Houston Astros bullpen. I'd rather see it working in the Chicago Cubs bullpen. So this is like um, one of those guys, the Miami Marlins seem to have like 77 of where you're just yeah. like, there's another one of them that throw 98 <laughs> with a plus, like plus plus change up sometimes. And so, yeah. but yeah, then yeah. they don't actually work out for the Marlins because they're the Marlins. So right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Um, all right. The, the other guy that I think really probably has the highest likelihood here, in my opinion, is Pablo Aliendo. Yep. Um, and I just, I, I've said it for a while now. And I, I think that the, the comparisons in my eyes to Miguel Amaya are 
um, too much for me. And I, I think that like, I, I, I could really, I would love to see him added to the 40 man roster. Catching is interesting, right? It, it's, it's for a guy to be selected away in the rule five draft as a catcher. Um, I think that you have to have a, a whole lot of confidence in having a three catcher, 26 man roster. And I think that like, if a team does that, then I think that Pablo Aliendo absolutely could go to another team. I think he's worth protecting. Um, catchers are interesting. Catchers are weird. Um, those like backup catchers and third catchers, like they, they don't have to get a whole lot of playing time at all throughout the year, depending on who you have you, as your starter. Um, and so like he, and he's shown enough, right? He's, he has improved every single year. I think he's gotten better at something every single year. Um, last year was kind of showing off some more pop. The body looked a whole lot stronger last year. Um, I think there's a whole lot to like about Pablo Aliendo. And so I, I, I'd love to see him get added to the 40 man roster and it wouldn't surprise me on him either. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you nailed the big thing about him is that he's just gotten so much better over the last probably two seasons, just like an insane to an insane degree. I think he's one where like you're really for me, the case against Pablo has nothing to do with him. It has to do with the value of a 40 man spot and the and the amount of catchers that you're ever going to have on a 40 man. I think the Cubs are going to look at it and they're going to say we probably want three catchers on the 40 man. And if I had to guess going into this off season, they probably want to add one more veteran just to like have a look in spring training, whether, whether that guy makes the major league roster, whether he gives Miguel Amaya some competition in spring training or whether he's sort of there to be a, you know, adult in the room during spring training. I don't know, but I think the Cubs are going to want that. And so then I don't think they're going to look at the 40 man and say, we want 10% of it to be catchers. Um, so I think the value of having Pablo next year, not on the 40 man roster, but in Iowa as insurance is so fantastic. That's all upside for the Cubs that they're going to, they're going to really try for that. I think. Yeah. I'm yeah. You, you kind of nailed the way you described that. I, I, I think that, I think that Pablo Aliendo being what next year he'll be 22, 23 being in Iowa is really interesting. It's like super interesting. Cause like I, a lot of times you're carrying the guys you're carrying at catcher in Iowa are not 22, 23 year old catchers, right? They're, they're, they're Dom the P- Nunez, yeah. PJ Higgins, who was brought back. They're those guys. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that I'm kind of interested to see it's, it's an interesting part of this is do they bring PJ Higgins back on a minor league deal? It seems like they, they really like having PJ in the organization, obviously losing him and bringing him back mid season last year from the diamondbacks. Um, that becomes really interesting because obviously he's not going to take up a 40 man roster spot. It's like, okay, you can have Pablo working with PJ in Iowa. Pablo's on the 40 man roster. Um, if there's an injury to either Miguel Amaya or, uh, Amaya or Jan Gomes at the major league level, it's like you don't have to Go call to PJ. up. Yeah, yeah, you 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 add PJ to the forty man roster. Don't risk losing him off waivers again when you move him back off the forty man roster and back down to Iowa. I don't know. That's really interesting. I I don't think that that the Pablo's forty uh, man roster addition or protection from the Rule Five draft is up to uh, what happens with the signing of PJ Higgins. I don't think that's that's how it works. But it kind of feels that way a little bit, right? Like how who they can bring in alongside them. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that it's awesome to me. It's terrific that they've taken, um, this catcher that was not on anybody's radars two and a half years ago. And now he is in serious discussion for being added to the 40 man roster and his first shot at, at doing so, um, in his pro career. The thing I'm really curious about with his case specifically is how much are teams looking at the ball change in double a and making yeah. really strong decisions over, the second half of the season, because that would be a vote against Pablo. He hit, uh, I have it right here, 227, 332, 422 in the second, like after the ball changed in double A, uh, which is probably about a league average OPS, maybe even a little, little better. His strikeout rate was still an issue, still like above, um, just right about at 30%, only six home runs. You know, if you want to get super nerdy, I would wonder ball like less tacky ball means that the ball doesn't spin as much so guys that are getting home runs off backspin that's actually going to go down after the ball change so would you worry that the power breakout wasn't as real as we saw in the first half if we saw less home runs in the second half that's like i mean that's probably like galaxy brain thinking a little bit 
but teams teams might get there and um you know i don't know if you think that like teams are gonna have any second thought about draft like drafting him if you think that you know there's only a 30 20 percent chance he gets drafted then like you have to preserve that 40 man roster spot those are too valuable to to do in that case so and i think that just might be in play here yeah, let, let's talk about, let's go to, to the pitching side of things. There's three guys that we want to talk about pitching. And I think that let's start speaking of, of the kind of the positional value with a catcher. Let's talk about a lefty reliever in Bailey Horn. Okay. Um, Cause I think that when you find good lefty relievers, um, those are some guys that seem more likely to be selected away from you in the, in the rule five draft. And Bailey yeah. Horn was a guy that we were calling for, for the, his promotion up to Chicago uh, in what, August, July and August of this year. I mean, um, I feel like in June. maybe. Yeah. Even. Yeah. So I don't know your, your take on Bailey Horn and his potential addition. Yeah. I mean, I, he's a real, he's like a real like fit one. Like if he, if he gets added to the 40 man roster, like part of the reason for the Cubs is they're like, this guy could pitch it. This guy could win a job in spring training for our bullpen. Um, you know, you mentioned P like, does PJ Higgins factor into that Aliendo decision? Does Brandon Hughes factor into this decision? I think is a real question for me. Like, you know, I mean, we look at the lefty reliever problems the Cubs had in the sort of first half or like mid season of this year, that's with Brandon Hughes injured. And that's with Luke little, you know, back then pitching in a ball or double a, mm-hmm. um, those two things have ha- have changed going into 2024, which I think is probably the case against Bailey. Um, stuff wise, really good. I mean, when he learned the sweeper slider, like his game really took off. He's he's a guy who's like really sort of like naturally just strong dude who like sometimes just like shows up to the ballpark ready to sit 95, 96. You know, other times it's more like 93. Um, but very solid player. Like if he finds consistent feel he's a big league arm and he could easily like stick in a big league bullpen for 10 years. The question I think is like, it seems like one, out of, one out of every five outings, he's just like not the same guy as the other four. Yeah. I, I would not, I mean, with all, all five of these guys we're specifically talking about, but just wouldn't be surprised at all. If, yep. if Bailey Horn got added, I think that, yeah, I, I he, he hasn't been mentioned a whole lot. I, I feel like too, which is weird considering how how much we were beating the drum for him getting called up to sh- Chicago earlier this year. So that's weird. Uh, speaking of guys with really good stuff, Porter Hodge has really good stuff. And actually, Baseball America this past week came out with an article talking about how good that stuff is. Um, some of the best in in all of baseball in terms of uh, the slider, especially, um, and then the cut fastball is what I'll call it. Um, and I, I think if a team is identifying who they want to draft based on stuff that could play in the big leagues. Porter Hodge has that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like last year, I think was really getting used to the reliever role. Uh, it'd be really interesting to know if there was a team out there that still thought he could start because like, to me, that's, that, that's not totally off the table. I think, I think the Cubs moved him to reliever because they thought there was a chance that he was going to really take off and pitch in Wrigley by the end of the year, like Luke Little did. Like, I really think that that was on the table in their minds. It just didn't quite happen. I mean, just like Bailey Horn, like another one where it was, it would be like he would have six pretty good outings in a row and the seventh would be just a total mess. Or, you know, he'd have two really bad ones and then have five good ones in a row. Like that, that kept happening to him stuff wise. It's awesome. I mean, it's 20 inches of horizontal break on a slider you know, I'm not, I, I won't bore people too much with getting nerdy on the baseball America write up, but I don't think that he throws a cutter. I just think he has one of the most unique fastballs in baseball. And if like, if that pitch becomes 97, a lot of the time and is being like classified as a cutter and baseball savants, you know, pitch classification thing, like a team, a team could look at that potential and be like, Oh my God, like this could be a guy throwing 97 mile per hour, like cutters. Uh, sign us up so i could see him getting drafted i think it's just a little too inconsistent to to probably get a spot here yeah the michael arias i picture in the bullpen for the astros porter hodge i picture working for the tampa bay rays there you go um all right let's let's uh wrap up these five guys with a guy that we've talked plenty about cole franklin uh we were having this discussion about cole last year right uh he was rule five eligible last year um and I, i think that it was it was really a, a tough debate on if he would get added or not, if he would be drafted or not. 
Um, I think that that conversation just carries over to this year in terms of, of what he is as a player, um, as a starting pitcher, right? You're not, I mean, you mentioned Porter Hodge is potentially starting again. Um, but I think Cole Franklin, you still have a starting pitcher here. You got a guy with good stuff. Um, I, I could see him getting selected for sure. Yeah, I think there are some teams that really like him. I mean, I think at the all-star break this season, like the year he was having was like pretty loud. The the couple starts he had at high A at the beginning of the year before he moved up to double A were absolutely awesome. I mean, mm-hmm. like the best version of him. I think the thing with him, and like with all these guys, I'm making the devil's advocate case on like why not to add him because really like you're arguing against those 40 man spots. The case against him for me is that I don't think going to the bullpen is going to do a lot for Cole's game. I think, you know, the fastball, I think, is probably Cole's weakest pitch, um, even though he can throw it like 95 to 100 miles per hour. It's just a little straight and um, hitters seem to barrel it up a little often. But um, so if he's not going to take a jump in a bullpen, if you're only valuing him as a starter, like, there's only 150 starter spots in the major mm-hmm. league baseball. That's a really hard job to break into. So if you don't have that backboard to fall on, I think your major league case gets a little less. And so to me, his floor is just a little lower than those other guys. And that's why I think ultimately, you know, the Cubs try to sneak him through as well. Yeah. Can I run through these five guys real quick again? And, and the, the, because I think all of them have very clear reasons why you would keep them or why, why we as fans like would want to keep them and reasons, uh, reasons why a team would select them. Right. So like we talked about with Cole, like it, it's, it's been a guy we've dreamed on for a long time. That's why you want to keep them. Uh, the team that would select him away is a really bad team that has a, a starting pitcher role available for him all season long um, with Bailey Horn you want to keep him because he is that lefty reliever. Um, a team that takes him is a, is, a, is a team that could slot him in at the major league level as as their second lefty reliever. Uh, Porter Hodge, you want to keep him because the stuff's nasty. Uh, mm-hmm. A team would want to select him because they, they think they can harness that enough to, to keep him around. Michael Arias, is your, he has the highest upside, right? I think that of, of this bunch, he has the highest upside you can dream on. That's why you want to keep him. Um, but that's also uh, a, a team that would select him is a guy that can probably be a team that can be okay with him struggling for an entire year at the big league level. Pablo Aliendo, you want to keep him because catchers are catching prospects are hard to come by. Um, the team that will take him is the team that can probably have him as their third catcher at the big league level. So um, those are actually pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of these five guys. Don't you think? Yes. I, I think that's a great rundown. Um, all right. Uh, can I actually, so I, I guess real quick before I run through these last, last few names, that I think that, that probably will not get selected, but are worth mentioning. Yeah. Arius is your pick, right? Yeah. Michael Arius. Okay. Um, I guess if I, if I have to throw a name, I, like I said at the beginning, I don't, I don't really have a pick. Um, I think, I think I'm going to go with Arius too. I think I'm going to go with Arius. I, I think the sleeper pick for me is, is Bailey Horn here though. I think um, my sleeper pick is Hodge. As we talked it out, I have to say, I went into this pretty <laughs> determined over what my answer was. I think that um I think that talking it out, I'm like, shoot, I think <laughs> I think maybe Porter Hodge is is the guy. So, you know, it'll be interesting. Are you willing to go up to go up to two guys there? No. They get no, I mean those two guys, there's some real like overlap and similarity between yeah. um, you know, just in terms of like future role and you know things they're good at and stuff like that so i would not add both of them i think i think the cubs like really do have to pick there all right nine guys worth just throwing into this episode here um eduardo nunez um has signed a a successor contract and he is rule five eligible um Mm -hmm. darius hill is another guy that we had a conversation with last year uh worth kind of throwing in here ezekiel pagan is um is worth throwing out there as well he did make it up to double a so that's fun uh, i could see him just i could see him just kind of holding his own and, and and batting batting 265 on a team right um cam sanders also a guy we had a conversation about last year the stuff is obviously really good just can't find it uh jake slaughter is worth throwing out there chase strumpf is is another guy that was uh, uh has been around i had to throw him in there you know damn well i did uh, Riley Thompson is Riley Thompson is interesting 
we were having, I think Riley Thompson is a guy we had a conversation about last year too. Yeah. Um, the stuff, the stuff is, is intriguing to me. Um, Blake Whitney is, is rule five eligible. And while he's a much older guy, I think that, I think that a team, um, he, he's done nothing but shove during his time in the minor leagues. Like he's put up really good numbers. A team might say, screw it. Like, what about Blake Whitney? Um, and then Bryce Windham, uh, it seems like the least likely of this bunch, but the same way that you talk about, uh, catchers and Pablo Aliendo, I think that Bryce Windham gets thrown into this, um, good athlete. He spent time in triple a already. Right. Um, yeah. I think unlikely with all of these guys, but I kind of wanted to just kind of squeeze their names into here somehow, some way. Let me ask you this. Cause so there's a whole nother part of this that we're not going to really get into, but there's a minor league phase to the rule five draft. Yeah. In very short, the Cubs would have 38 slots in triple a to protect guys from the minor league phase. So, you know, basically the top 40 guys eligible for the rule five draft will not be eligible for the minor league phase. If the Colorado Rockies come to Greg Huss tomorrow and they go, we'll give you $5,000 to give us two players names that, that you think will be available for, from the Cubs in the minor league phase of the rule five draft. Who are two guys that you think might be on the outside there that you would want on another, like that you want to get a shot guys that wouldn't you guys that wouldn't necessarily be protected. Like we won't know. Like that, that's, that's the thing is, is with we, the will not phase, we will not know what their, what their but, it's 38, right? 38 yeah. man list is. Yep. Um, so just go like deep down that list. Like give me a, give me a sleeper. A sleeper that I've got as I'm, I'm scrolling through the list here. You guys can check, um, either the cover, the cover reporter, reporter yeah. or on Northside bound. Both have the list there available. Um, I'm kind of looking at guys that might, that were injured. Um, yeah. Tyler Schlafer might be interesting. He will, he will not be, I, I, I would, I would be shocked if Tyler Schlafer is protected. Um, He's coming off Tommy John. He missed all of last year. Um, I, I Tyler Schlafer makes sense. I don't know. Do you, you think he'd be a guy that, we, that would be protected? I do. I mean, depending on the rehab. But, um, yeah, I mean, minor league phase, you lose the guy forever. There's no way that it comes back to you. Yes. And so I think just the the possibility that he comes back something is too much. I, I think he gets protected. But I'm going to count that as one of your two. You got any picks here as I'm continuing? Yeah. Through? I would, you uh, I'm going to go Miguel Pabon, um, you know, Myrtle mm. beach Pelicans catcher this year, former shortstop that's been converted to catcher. And like when we had Sam on the episode, like Sam talking about Miguel and just the yeah. human he is, you know, is like, yeah, uh, he just gushed over him. And like, I think like that guy has added some physicality in the last couple of years. Like if he, if he all of a sudden hit like, 16 home runs in the minors next year it would not shock me at all and um you know it wouldn't you shock you at all it, i don't think it would <laughs> i don't think it would he's coming i, I love Myrtle i love Miguel Pabon. i love him i love him it would <laughs> shock me if he hit 16 next year okay yeah, yeah good call good <laughs> I, lo- I, I do he, he's the man he's i've heard nothing but awesome things but 16 home runs is is that, yes. that's that's quite a few you know what that's fair uh i don't think the uh, what about fabian pertuz yeah, Fabian Pertuz. Early on in the year, I was like, "Man, like th- this guy found something." Yeah. Um, and then I, the numbers just kind of went downhill after that. Um, there's a whole lot more swing and miss as the season went on. I thought, but Fabian Pertuz is is will be my second guy here. I'll go. Um, last guy, Saul Gonzalez, who the Cubs, yeah, who the Cubs acquired from Michael Givens, who was hurt most of the year. Just a guy that like now has been in two sort of pitching development plans. Huge body, big dude you know, a guy that could take off when he gets healthy. I like it. All right. I was not prepared to do that, but I, I, I kind of <laughs> like that. That That's some ending on some real nerdy stuff. That's yep. great. Um, all right, man, you got anything else you want to add to this episode? No, I think, I think we hit it. All right. You uh, want to go ahead and, and plug yourself. Where, where can we find you? What's, what's the deal with you over on, on your end here? Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully some of you guys follow me on Twitter at, at cub prospects. If you did, if you do, then you probably heard, in the last couple of weeks that I uh, sort of made the decision to leave Bleacher Nation where I had written for the last five seasons, uh, just going to take some time off, um, sort of see see what happens with the itch to write and the itch to, to sort of keep doing this as a hobby, um, you know, be 
be a little more of a dad, a little more of just, uh, you know, a, a person living in the world and, and see what comes of it. So, yeah, I think I'll just sort of be on Twitter occasionally. Uh, so that's where you can mostly find the work. And then, you know, right here on this podcast, I'll, I'll, I'll be throwing hotter takes now that I don't have to, you know, sort of live up to them in the written word. Dude, you're going to be really what this what this does is you, you get to build up some like notes on your phone that you are not going to go in, in right. an article. And you're like, ah, oh, I'm ready to just spew all this knowledge out on the podcast. So that's, 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 that's where my Miguel Pabon hot takes come. <laughs> Instead of the last bullet of whatever, like whatever right. uh, article you write, it's 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 coming out here on, on minute number 40 of the of the episode. So. Yeah, I uh, no, I'm excited to keep keep going on with you on the on the podcast throughout this off season. It's gonna be a fun off season to cover, um, and uh, you can find find me on Twitter at um, at out of the vines. You can find the show uh, Cubs on deck on Instagram, Cubs on deck pod on um, Twitter. I, I have that. I, I don't really use that. I just use it to to drop videos that are also going on on the Instagram account. Uh, but it's, it's so there. disorienting disorienting to see videos of me just pop up in my feed i like i, I sort of forget that that exists and every so yeah. often i'm like oh my god i was drinking another beer <laughs> <laughs> i've been i have been uploading the uh the shorts onto youtube so i told you guys that i've, I've been i've been using that that'll go on there somewhere i've been uh I, I told you guys i'd be using the youtube a little bit more over at north sidebound on youtube and i have been uploading those shorts that's been fun that's I just really just got to get an editor for the show is, is what I need to do. So I don't have to worry about doing that stuff, but uh, yeah, sorry. If you guys are still around here, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in and listening. Like I said, we'll be back next week. Uh, we do have an interview lined up. Uh, I'll go ahead and say it, it's, it's, we have an interview with Cole Franklin lined up for next week's episode. So come back, listen to what Cole Franklin had to say about his season la- th- this past year. Uh, lots of really good stuff. And in the meantime, we'll talk to you guys in one short week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Go Cubs.